Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and back there is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. When SARS-CoV-2 first emerged in Wuhan, people were quick to point out that Wuhan was the home of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and that therefore SARS-CoV-2 could be the result of a lab leak. At the time, I personally thought it was a valid hypothesis and something that should have been investigated. Now, investigations in China proved to be very problematic, but scientists nevertheless have been able to gain a pretty good picture of the likely source of the outbreak. And that has culminated recently in the publication of two papers in the journal Science, which shed light on the likely cause of the outbreak. The two papers put together a compelling argument that SARS-CoV-2 emerged at the Huanan seafood market in two separate spillover events. So is this enough to finally put to bed the lab leak theory? In this video, I'll go over the key findings of the two papers as well as some of the criticisms that have emerged and if they are valid. These are the two papers. They were both published in the journal Science after a peer review process of approximately five months that included five reviewers on one paper and four reviewers on the other. The first paper is entitled the Molecular Epidemiology of Multiple Zoonotic Origins of SARS-CoV-2 and shows that there were at least two introductions of SARS-CoV-2 into humans, leading to lineages A and B, and that there was very limited undetected transmission of the virus in Wuhan before mid-December 2019. The second paper is entitled The Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan was the early epicentre of the COVID-19 pandemic and shows what the title suggests and in particular that the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 occurred via the live wildlife trade in China which was active at the Huanan market. So let's go back to the science and have a look at both papers in a little more detail, starting with the first paper. The first paper shows that SARS-CoV-2 before February 2020 likely comprised only two distinct viral lineages, denoted A and B, and that these lineages were the result of at least two separate cross-species transmission events into humans as opposed to a mutation in humans following an initial spillover. The first zoonotic transmission likely involved lineage B viruses around 18th of November 2019, while the second introduction of lineage A likely occurred a few weeks later. So we know that SARS-CoV-2 infection in humans came from two separate spillover events from animals. But where did that spillover occur? That's the question that is answered in the second paper. So the first thing that the paper shows is that the earliest cases on record from December cluster around the Huanan market and not the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is on the other side of the Yangtze River. And this is in a city with a total area of 8,000 square kilometres. So the area around the Huanan market is a tiny proportion of the whole city. And this clustering is still seen if you only consider cases that were not epidemiologically linked to the Huanan market, which means people who didn't work there, hadn't shopped there and had no known contact with someone linked to the market. In fact, these unlinked cases actually lived significantly closer to the market than those directly linked to the market, which is exactly what you would expect if the outbreak originated at the market. For example, a person who works at the market could visit a local restaurant and infect the staff and other patrons. This would result in many people living near the market getting infected, but none of them would be directly linked to the market. 
As we get into January and February, the pattern becomes more diffuse as the virus spreads throughout Wuhan. Again, this is consistent with emergence at the market in late November or early December 2019, followed by transmission throughout Wuhan and eventually the rest of China and the world. Another key piece of analysis is they compare the centre points for population density in Wuhan with the centre points of where the cases were. And they looked at this for both linked cases and unlinked cases. Now, this is a bit of a complicated figure, but the information we're interested in is in the orangey-yellow boxes. What it shows is that both linked and unlinked cases are centred much closer to the Huanan market than to the Wuhan population centre. But how do they know that the Huanan market was the epicentre of the outbreak, as opposed to just being a super spreader event? The authors of the study used social media check-in data to see what locations were most likely to be high risk for super spreader events. As you can see from this chart, Huanan got very little traffic and was much, much less likely to be the site of an early super spreader event than hundreds of other places in Wuhan. And if you consider the fact that the market was the epicentre of both lineage A and lineage B, the chances are astronomical. The second paper also covers the fact that environmental samples taken from the Huanan market tested positive for both lineage A and lineage B of SARS-CoV-2 and were lifted from objects associated with live animal sales, including cages, carts on which cages were stacked, and a hair and feather removal machine. And when they looked at the distribution of positive samples in the market, they saw that they were overwhelmingly associated with the west side where animals were sold and in the corner where the stalls sold animals. Also, when they looked at people who contracted COVID prior to December 20th, who were associated with the market, they were all on the west side of the market where the animals were. Although they were a little more dispersed because people can walk around, whereas the animals are confined to cages. So that's a summary of the key points in the papers. There's heaps more as well as some fancy statistical analyses and I'll provide a link to both papers so that you can read them thoroughly for yourselves. They're fairly easy to read. But now let's have a look at some of the criticisms of the papers. The criticisms fall into two main types. The first type accepts the findings of the paper but says it could have still happened as a result of the lab leak. The second type directly disputes the findings of the papers. So let's look at the first type of criticism. The argument here is the fact that the Huanan market was the epicentre of the outbreak doesn't mean the virus wasn't brought there by an infected lab worker. However, We have to remember that there were two separate spillovers from animals. This means if it originated in a lab, the first worker had to be infected by an animal in the lab, go directly to the market without interacting with anyone else before or afterwards. And then a few weeks later, a second lab worker would have to be infected by a different animal and again go directly to the market without interacting with anyone before or afterwards. Sure, this is possible, but it's not really very plausible. And what makes it even less plausible is that everyone who worked in the lab had their sera tested for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies and everyone was negative. Furthermore, all bat samples in the lab were also tested and again, SARS-CoV-2 wasn't found. Now, I'm sure detractors will point out that there could just be a massive cover-up involving everyone who worked in the lab and everyone who was involved in the testing, but there is further evidence from outside the lab. It just so happens that there was an Australian scientist working at the Wuhan Institute of Virology at the time the pandemic started. 
And she confirms that there was no one working in the lab who was sick at the time. And that she's also had her sera tested after she left Wuhan. And it was also negative for SARS-CoV-2. So as I said, the second lot of criticisms just reject the findings of the papers completely. And some of the reasons are quite bizarre. A number of people point out, for instance, the fact that the final peer-reviewed papers are different to the preprints, and in particular, the fact that the language is not as strong. They seem to think this is some sort of smoking gun. Anyone who has had papers peer-reviewed understands that papers do change when they're peer-reviewed. That's the whole point of it. And asking for more conservative language is a common request from reviewers. Most importantly, though, who cares if the papers have changed or not from the preprints? We are assessing what the peer-reviewed papers say now, so it's irrelevant if they have changed. Some people can't offer any actual criticism, so instead just resort to insults and suggestions of conspiracies, something which I am rather familiar with as similar things are also said continuously in the comments of my videos. Another common approach has been to misrepresent what the paper says by using an out-of-context quote from the introduction. The quote they use is, however, the observations that the preponderance of early cases were linked to the Huanan market does not establish that the pandemic originated there. But they leave out what follows, which includes... In this study, we obtained data from a range of sources to test the hypothesis that the COVID-19 pandemic began at the Huanhan market. Despite limited testing of wildlife sold at the market, collectively, our results provide evidence that the Huanhan market was the early epicentre of the COVID-19 pandemic and suggests that SARS-CoV-2 likely emerged from the live wildlife trade in China. In other words, the authors didn't just use the observation that the preponderance of early cases were linked to the Huanan market. They used data from a number of sources, which is what the paper is about. Another criticism people make is the fact that SARS-CoV-2 wasn't found in any animals at the market. The reason for this is simple. The animals at the market that are of the type expected to be an intermediary host of SARS-CoV-2, like raccoon dogs, for instance, were never sampled as they had already been removed from the market before samples could be taken. You can't find what you haven't tested. A lot of criticism of the paper comes from a scientist called Alina Chan, who is also the author of a book called Viral, the search for the origin of COVID-19. A key part of her criticism is she claims that the data used in the second paper suffered from ascertainment bias. Ascertainment bias basically means that the method of collecting data means that it is skewed and not representative of the population. Her argument in relation to the study is that they were only looking for cases associated with the Huanan market. So that's what they found. To support her claim, she highlights this section from the China Who joint report, which states, an association with the Huanan market was identified amongst some of the earliest recognised cases. And for a short period until mid-January 2020, exposure to the Huanan market was included in the case definition. But she completely ignores the following sentence. It rapidly became clear, however, that there were cases without a link to the Huanan market. And this element of the definition was dropped a few days after being introduced. Most importantly, she ignores the fact that the authors of the study specifically tested the data to ensure that it didn't suffer from ascertainment bias. And she also dismisses this peer-reviewed study that provides further evidence that no ascertainment bias occurred for no other reason than it had a single author. The fact that it had four peer reviewers isn't mentioned by her. 
In this study, they just looked at cases that were identified before the link with the market was known. So it wasn't possible to have any ascertainment bias. And as you can see, they still cluster around the market. So it appears that there aren't really any valid criticisms to the two studies, which together provide strong evidence that SARS-CoV-2 resulted from two separate spillover events from animals at the one end market. Does this mean people will now change their minds based on this new evidence? Probably not. Will they change their minds if further evidence is uncovered in the future to support it? Probably not. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that YouTube will share it with more people. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.